we're not compartmentalized as individuals. You know, we are women who are black, who come from a certain background and so on and so forth. And all of these things truly do intersect um, in our interactions with other people and in the way that we position ourselves in the world. And so feminism that does not look at those things is not really looking at whole individuals, but it's looking at people as though we were ideas, you know, um, which is not a real or realistic thing to do. My name is Mina Salami and I'm Nigerian and Finnish. And I live in London. I've been living here for about 10 years. Prior to that, I lived in New York and I've lived in Spain, I've lived in Sweden and in Nigeria where I grew up. I'm a writer and I write a blog called Miss Afropolitan, which is a pan-African feminist blog. And I write this blog first and foremost, um, you know, because it's my passion. I write about topics that I care deeply about, um, about things that I want to learn of. Um, and things that I want to raise consciousness about that I think um, are neglected stories in the media. Yes, appearance does matter. Um, it, is, it is the first thing that we put out there um, in our interactions with others. Also with ourselves, you know, the way that we, we feel about ourselves to an extent has to do with our appearance. Um, it should be a healthy extent, you know, hopefully, um, but it certainly plays into our, our views of ourselves and how we carry ourselves in the world. Um, first time I became aware of my appearance, probably I was about 10, 11, 12, and I was in secondary school in Nigeria, which is sort of high school. Um, and. I guess I was, yeah, coming of age era and starting to take interest in boys and perhaps they were starting to take interest in me. And I remember, I mean, sadly, the first memory of becoming aware of my appearance is also my becoming aware that maybe there was something wrong with my appearance because I, I, I kind of have the first memory of that linked to wanting to look different. Um, and so... Yeah, I, I, I remember wanting to have straight hair. Um, that's my first vivid memory of becoming aware of my appearance. Um, and it wasn't straight hair, kind of white hair, but straight, relaxed hair in particular. I think it had something to do with wanting to look more grown up. Um, and it was also perhaps something that other friends of mine had this kind of impact on. Is there anything I would change about my appearance? No. Um, I'm. I feel very grateful to, you know, speak healthy. It's a cliche, but I truly do. Um, and I'm not fussed about, you know, wanting to have a perfect this or a perfect that. I feel, I feel happy and content with myself. Um, it hasn't always been the case. You know, certainly there, there have been times in my youth when I would have said yes, I wanted to change this or that, but no, not anymore. I mean, for me, the process of coming to embrace myself and accepting myself um, and my looks and who I am has has been really quite difficult because when I when I moved from Nigeria to Europe, I I really felt I felt very out of place. I felt unattractive. I didn't feel like I matched the beauty ideals. And the process of coming to terms and accepting myself has been very much about two things. Um, the first is redefining beauty. So this question that I mentioned earlier of asking what is beauty was very key to me in order to, to redefine beauty for myself. And secondly, and it kind of subsequently from that, it is, um, was finding alternative ideals of beauty. So realizing that I wasn't going to feel good about myself if I followed what the media dictated was beautiful or what fashion magazines said was beautiful. So I kind of started to seek alternative um, ideals of beauty and I, I cannot emphasize how much of a change that made in my life. that I would send to women about beauty is 
to ask themselves the question, what is beauty? And to ask that question very seriously. And when I've asked that question, I realize that there's three different types of beauty as I see it. Um, there's political beauty, there's artificial beauty, and there's genuine beauty. Um, and I'm sure there's a whole host of more types of beauty, but these are the three that I identified. Um, and political beauty is, it's an idea of beauty that fits with a political agenda. And in the world that we live in, which is male dominant, political beauty has the agenda of making women perpetually inferior to men. And so what that does is say that women do not contribute to society with their intellect or with science or leadership, but rather their contribution is based on how they look and how attractive they are. And furthermore, that idea is very rigid. So you're an attractive woman if you have ABC. Um, so this is beauty that is defined by a very political agenda. Um, artificial beauty is beauty that is unlike political beauty. It's just empty underneath. It has a veneer. And it's an illusion. It, it looks great and it's, it's a kind of good imposter of real beauty. Um, but underneath it all, it's, it's quite empty. And then there's genuine beauty, which I think is something that's quite... Um, everlasting and linked to our emotional world and particularly to passion um, and I don't mean passion in a sensual or sexual way necessarily but passion about living um, passion about the work that a person does or passion about anything but just I've never seen a person who is passionate about something that isn't beautiful there's just something that radiates from that and that kind of beauty um, is the only type of beauty worth pursuing um, that that's my message to women <laughs>